Okay, it's Friday, everybody. You ready for today? Here we go. The most controversial verses in the letter to the Colossian church because we don't understand the culture in which it was written. I, I, we started uh, this week talking about uh, verse 11, how the family of God uh, was reordered by Jesus. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. He's reordering what it means to be a part of the chosen people of God, to be a part of of his family. In fact, Jesus told us he would do that. When Jesus saw his actual mother, Mary, and his brothers, he said to them, who are my mother and my brothers? And he looks at the disciples who he's not related to, and he says, these are my mother and my brothers. And what he means is that the family of God is his primary family, and that family is a very diverse family. And the family looks different than what the world thinks of family. See, in the Greco-Roman world, particularly within the Roman Empire, it was in a very predominantly male-dominant culture. And so the verses I'm about to read, you may have heard some pastors wrongfully teach these before, that a very strict authoritarian understanding of them that actually lined up more with the Roman understanding of family than the countercultural understanding of family that God uh, espouses through the Apostle Paul here in this passage. So let's look at the verses together, and we're going to have a little fun with them because you can't talk about controversial stuff and take it uh, too seriously or you'll lose your mind. Verse 18, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Women, don't you love that verse? Isn't that a fun one? Wives, submit to yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. First of all, it doesn't say all women, by the way. It says wives. But uh, talking to the wives first, I want you to notice here that it says submit yourselves to the... It's also going to talk about children. It's going to talk about slaves here in a moment or servants. And those, it's going to say obey. But the wives in particular, he's denoting something very different than what the Roman uh, paterfamilia, the Roman understanding of family was. The uh, paterfamilia was the, the paternal person, the father, had complete control of the family. The woman, the wife, had no say. She would do whatever the husband said. She didn't get to choose of whether to submit to herself or not. She just had to obey. And here, Paul, in a very subtle way, is uh, differentiating the family of God and the way that we as Christians should live within our biological family units from the way that the Romans lived. Rather than this authoritarian, top-down view of leadership where the husband is in control of the wife, the wife gets to choose to submit herself to the husband as is fitting for the Lord. And rather than a hierarchical approach where the husband lords over the wife and dictates things, that uh, Christ first gave his life for us, and so he's the foundation we put our life on. And then husbands, you are meant to, to rest in Christ, right? And, and then we are meant to support our wives, not over lording over them in an authoritative way. And, and wives, we are to, uh, you are to uh, choose to submit to them out of love for your husband, and husbands are meant to, to love your wives. Look at verse 19, husbands love your wives and do not be harsh with them. See, that's so countercultural. In no way, shape, or form would the Roman family ever have been like that. You don't, out of love for them, not be harsh to them. You're in complete control. They should do what you want because you are the, the paternal person in the family. You are the father, you're in charge. See, Paul is telling them that uh, husbands, you're supposed to support and lift up your wives and love them well. And, and wives, because you're going to trust that, that God is going to work in your husband's life, you're going to submit your life over to him in his care. Just as all of us as Christians are meant to submit our lives to the Lord and allow him to hold us up and prop us up. It's only the failure of many of the men who have turned to a, an anti-Christian understanding of this authoritarian vi version of being a husband of why women so often don't trust their husbands the way that Paul is encouraging the church in Colossae to trust one another. And then even look what it says here about children. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. See, in that culture, you had complete control of your children, too. They didn't have to choose to obey. They better obey or you're going to make them obey. Uh, let's be honest. Dads, I mean, don't you kind of want to still do that today? <laughs> I know it's so hard sometimes to raise children, but Paul is, is challenging uh, the, the husbands and the dads there that, like, don't embitter your children. Don't discourage them and despair them. Instead, build them up. Help them to become the man or the woman God created them to be. 
That, that if you are to be the, the leader of your household, how did Christ lead? He laid down his life as a ransom for many. And so for our wives and for our children, we are meant to lay down our lives. Now look, I'm also not saying that we have to be subjugated to particular roles. I really believe God has created all kinds of different men and all kinds of different women, and that often, sometimes, uh, I've met women who God has given all kinds of leadership gifts to, and I have met men who honestly married women who are just incredible leaders, and they find a way to balance each other out. And and look, uh, regardless of your theological viewpoint of that, I believe that we as Christians need to submit and love each other the way that Paul is teaching us here in this passage. See, it's revolutionary to the paternal family that Paul was referring to. And so it goes on then, and it goes beyond just children. It says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Several things here. First of all, slavery was not American version of slavery in, in you know, American history. This wasn't a particular people group from a different ethnicity, from a different continent taken and wrongfully enslaved and imprisoned and forcibly made to labor for people for uh, you know, generations. Instead, this is you chose to be, uh, sell yourself into slavery in order to survive. And after seven years, it would be forgiven. But I'm, even back then, there were people that took advantage of those things, absolutely. But what uh, the Apostle Paul is not doing here is saying slavery is okay in any way, shape, or form. In fact, he's kind of breaking the norm once again. He's, he's saying, yes, work as if you're working for the Lord in all things, but he's also doing something totally countercultural. He's including them in the family of God. They share in the inheritance just like the children do. In fact, the Apostle Paul is uh, going to send Onesimus, a slave of one of the guys in the church in Colossae, Philemon, had owned Onesimus as a slave, and Paul sends Onesimus back during the same time they deliver the letter to the Colossian church. He delivers the letter to Philemon that's also in the New Testament, encouraging Philemon to forgive him and set him free, which will occur then. It's an incredible story, and we'll talk more about it next week. But the beautiful picture of the family of God here is that God is telling us through the Apostle Paul that we must reorient the family of God to one that uses uh, the structure and the power and the authority that in this case the man had in the household, and rather than using it to be an authoritarian, to lord over people, that we would submit as Christ uh, lived his life as a ransom for many, that we would love our, our wife enough, love our children children enough, love even those in our our household that may not be biologically related to us and invite them in and actually sacrifice for them. It's a total reorienting, uh, reorienting the family of God. For the men today, what would it look like for you to really love your family well? To to wake up every day and say, I'm going to sacrifice for them. I've never met a a woman who did not desire a man, no matter what her beliefs were, desire a man who would actually do everything for her and the children and not put themselves first. And then for for wives to actually see the good in your husband and trust him enough to submit to him and to submit to one another in this mutual relationship. And it's not that one person is above the other or closer to God by any means. It's, It's that both have right union with God and we get to come together and trust each other in the beautiful thing we call marriage. And then that our children, we're not gonna embitter and discourage them. And even those that aren't biologically related to us, we're gonna invite them into the family of God with one another. And the interesting thing here, when it mentions slavery, is that actually there's only like one verse that talks about masters. There's multiple verses that talks about those who are servants or slaves. Doulos is the New Testament Greek term. It also meant servant. And, and in this passage in particular, it mentions it multiple times because there were a number of servants or slaves in the early church. In fact, probably more than there were masters. That's why he mentions it so much. They were all a part of God's family, all a part of the diverse family of God that is the church. 
So when Jesus says, who are my mother and who are my brothers, we're all part of the same family. Literally, if you didn't grow up in a great family, if there is abuse and, and neglect in your background and you don't have a, a good father figure or a good mother figure, I want to tell you the perfect family of God eternally in heaven. There will be no more tears or shaming or guilting or abuse or any of the stuff that you've experienced in this life. It's a beautiful thing that won't be this authoritarian top down view of one person lording over others other people will be the family of God working together, loving each other well. Don't you want to be a part of a family like that? Man, I do. I do, man. And I just look around our culture today and all of the angst and the anger. And if we just simply invited people in and loved people well, the way that Paul challenged the church in Colossae to do, that we could be revolutionary in reaching people for Christ healing each other's wounds, serving each other well. And so I just want to give you the opportunity to one more time here, consider the family of God. Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers? You are the brother or sister of Christ. You can join in his family today. Will you pray with me, God? I know I want to be a part of a family like that. I pray we as the local church would represent that type of family And Jesus, thank you. You are at the center of this family. We submit and surrender to your will for us first and foremost. We thank you that as we began the week in verse 11, that neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, that we're all a part of the family or God. And it doesn't matter if we're male or female, God, that we all can know you and have a relationship with you. And so right now, if anybody's out there that would like to join the family of God, pray this with me. God, I I receive... I receive your invitation to join your family and I submit my life to you fully. I'm coming home. We love you, Jesus. We give you this day and this week. We pray this in your name and everybody said, amen. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you on Monday morning, 8 a.m. Thanks for watching.